Hello, and welcome to the Choralosophy Podcast. This is episode 62, Filling in the Gaps with Choir. The guest on this show is actually an entire choir. Laura Ritter and the Walters State Chamber Choir are with me in this episode. And Laura is a regular listener of the show. She's also a member of the Choralosophers Facebook page. And she was gracious enough to be a guinea pig with me here and trying a new type of podcast for choir folks to listen to, where I put a feeler out on that Choralosophers Facebook page and said, hey, who would be willing to put their choir out there? Uh, Talk to your singers about coming on a podcast where we get to have a group discussion. And that's what we did. I felt like it was important to hear what some singers in choirs, student choirs in particular, have to say about certain questions. We covered topics like why are you in choir? These are college age singers in the Walter State group. So that means they took choir as kids, obviously, probably, I guess, uh, and they stuck with it. So why? What does it mean to you? Also, what does it mean to you in a choral setting when you feel safe and secure and like you belong? Like what keeps you coming back? I was very proud of these young singers for stepping up and sharing how they felt uh, about these topics, because that's always tricky knowing that there's an audience, and it's always tricky, too, knowing your teacher is standing there listening. But I think that's the value of this type of an episode, because we know as choir directors that there are oftentimes things that go unsaid in choir rehearsals. Singers, students who don't feel comfortable raising their hand and saying, hey, I'm feeling this way, or, or I think we should try this. And we have to strive to create those opportunities. And that's what I've done in this episode. So I hope you enjoy. Stick around and hear all the different speakers in this episode. Patreon.com forward slash Choralosophy is a place that you can join a volunteer subscription community for as little as $3 a month. Heck, if every single one of you listening were to join this Patreon, I could do this show as a full-time job. And it is a lot of work. And so the people over at Patreon have chosen to, to sign in, Chip in as little as $3 a month over there. And you also get some pretty cool features by checking out that website and some materials that I've created, extra episodes, that kind of thing. There is also a producer level at Patreon. So shout out to those folks, Ulrika Igrain, Munoz Alarcón, Chandler Smith, David Kowalsik, James Mock, Kyle Peterson, Michael Heron, Ryan Main, Steve and Kathy Kakachik. Have you renewed your Sight Reading Factory membership yet this year for you and all of your students? If not, get started. It's not ever too late, in my opinion, to give your students the gift of confident literacy and the empowerment that that brings. It's amazing what happens when you really start to see the growth and you see that confidence build in their eyes. You can always use Coralosophy at checkout to get 10% off your whole order. For a school's order, that's a big savings, and you can use that code every time you renew each school year. How do you like my southern accent? Oh, it's it's delicious. <laughs> That's a new word. Okay, so you take over. All right, great. Okay, everybody, I am here with the Walter State Chamber Choir with Miss Ritter, their director. And this is a Choralosophy podcast first in that not only am I speaking to a choir director, but I'm speaking with an entire choir, uh, which is something that I wanted to try. And here's uh, for the folks in the room that I'm talking to you right now and for the listeners uh, who are listening. I wanted to try this because for two years, I've been doing this show now uh, focused almost entirely on what choir directors have to say about choir, which is fine because it's primarily geared towards directors who listen to the show. That being said, we are charged with directing students, with singers in our choirs. And just as I'm always preaching to my audience that we should also be singers in choirs when we direct choirs because we need to know what that feels like. So now I'm going to try to practice what I preach by talking to singers in a choir about what it's really like to be in a choir, because not all of us continue to do that on a regular basis once we become directors. And I think it's important for us to always flip the script and think about things from the other side of, I guess you could say their hierarchy, the different ladders in a choir hierarchy that there might be. And so that's important. So thanks everybody for being on the show. So what I'd like to do first is I just want to get a sense from uh, you all of, and, and from you too, Laura, about what this group uh, means to you in terms of uh, your day-to-day routine, how it, it could be anywhere from things that you think or feel about the choir experience uh, in, in, your, in your school, 
in your upbringing, all the way to the nuts and bolts of how it fits into your life. You know, is it something that you have to squeeze in? Do you have to work really hard to get this choir to happen in terms of your schedules? Uh, really, any stories you have to tell me about that would be great. But what does is, what is being in the Walter State Choir mean? I think for me, um, this choir is just a place. Oh, pause. Can you introduce yourself first? Oh, sorry. My name is Madison. Madison Green. Um, I'm a sophomore here at Walter State. What do you study? Um, I'm a, actually an elementary education major. Awesome. Awesome. Go ahead. So I think for me, this choir is um, really important because it's like my closest friends doing things that we love to do. And even when it gets stressful, um, we look forward to coming back and to being with our friends and being with Miss Ritter. And it's really a family, even when we have um, our stressful times, especially right now with COVID and everything. So I think it's really a family. That's what it means to me, at least. Right. So you mentioned the stressful time that we're in right now and, and how choir gets to kind of still fill in some of that gap of what we're missing, right? Of where we're missing being around as many people and and choir can sometimes for some people become that only thing that they can salvage due to the uh, the times we're in. Now, I'm going to assume, uh, were you a singer in choir before college as well? Did you sing in your childhood? Yeah, um, my dad was actually a choir director my whole childhood and is for my church even now. Um, and I've sung my entire life. Um, but it wasn't really until high school that I started singing in a choir and then continued doing it in college. What was the first time that you really decided that choir was the place that you that you kind of felt at home? Um, from a from a young age, for me, just being in my dad's choir room and seeing all the people together and seeing them congregate and being a family felt really good to me. I am one of those people I like to socialize and I like to be around people. So I think that whenever I got to experience actually being in the choir and being the person there, that was when I really felt at home and kind of even got emotional just because I finally felt like I was where I was supposed to be. Yeah, well, I can tell you, we're, you, you and I are basically the same person. You can probably tell. Uh, my, I have a parent who was a choir director as well. And, and so the idea of not being in a choir for me uh, was always more foreign <laughs> than, yeah. than being in a choir. So that's, I, I can, I can identify with that for sure. Well, thank you so much. My name's Kelsey Mills and I'm a freshman here at Walter State and kind of like Madison, my dad is also a choir director at our church. He has been like my whole life and he's a music teacher at an elementary school. So I was basically raised being in his choirs that he did and, um, Choir, I, I've played a lot of sports my, my whole life, but being in choir is just like you connect with people in a way that you can't when you're playing sports or being a part of like a cheer team or something like you make close friends. But I think making music is something that it it connects people in a way that nothing else can. And that's what I've gained from choir. It just like even if you're not close with people at the beginning, they become like your best friends towards the end. And even in high school, it was my favorite class to go to. And now it's like during COVID, most of my classes are online and choir is like the only time that I can really get out of the house to be surrounded by people that I love. So. That's that's wonderful. Um, I have a couple of questions for you as well, because so it, it seems like the room is stocked full of, uh, of, of my twins. This is fantastic because I grew up uh, as a sports slash choir kid as well. So this is kind of a funny story where my father growing up, well, he's still my father. My father, when I was growing up, um, was a college baseball coach. That was his job. So I had, you know, college baseball coach for one parent and elementary school choir teacher for the other parent. It was like the two opposite, opposite extremes that you could imagine. Um, and so I grew up playing sports too. And so I have my own thoughts, I guess, about why it is. You, I like what you said about there are certain connections in choir that you that sports just can't give you. Sports can give you certain types of connections that are very important. And I don't want to poo-poo on sports at all because I love sports. And I, I'm, in fact, I'm coaching my son's baseball team started today. Um, and so I get that. But I agree that there are certain types of connections that ha can happen in a, in a choir or in, in, in a that intimate relationship that we can form in a choir that just 
doesn't quite happen in sports. Can you give some examples of that and why do you think that is? Just with our voices, like singing a song, you, it's like coming from within your heart, I guess, or like what you feel whenever you're, and like when everybody is relating to a song and coming together as one and experiencing that song, like whatever your experience may be, it could be completely different experiences, but when everybody is like emotionally involved and connected at that one point, it just makes the song beautiful and you're just, I don't know, there's just something about like finally getting a song and being able to relate to it and then it is like sounding amazing. It's just like we're all one person almost. Yeah. That's yeah. I have a th- I want the one theory that I have that uh, I like to discuss with sports slash music people is that in choir, you are all starters. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's a dynamic that if you're, if you're into the sports world at all, it, you, it's different because there is a certain, even though everyone on a sports team is the same team, they are kind of competing against each other for playing time. Yeah. Uh, in the sense that like, Yes, you're on my team. And yes, we both want to win. But I also have that aspect of I want to compete with you so that I can play and you can't, Mm -hmm. Um, which I I always tell my kids at school, like, imagine if that was choir. Like, imagine if you all had to come to school every day, come to choir every day, practice really hard. And then at the day of the concert, I get to decide which of you gets to sing. Mm -hmm. You know, and and since the choir doesn't have that aspect of it, I think it does create a little bit of a different, different dynamic. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. Well, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Isaiah Crawford, and I'm a sophomore at here at Walter State, and I'm in a K through five education major. And choir to me is just, it's just really important to me because whenever I was a kid, I was raised in church, and the first time I became, I got to sing was with this lady, she just pulled me over and she's like, Hey, I think you can sing. I'm like, what? Singing? (laughs) I was like six or seven. And I remember this, she just pulled me over and she said, here, try singing this song. And she sung it to me and I sung it back. And then like, I don't know, it's just something about that, about being able to be connected with someone through song that was so amazing and so different than like playing basketball or playing like baseball. It's just different being connected with someone through song because like when you're old, are you going to remember like winning the championship in your rec league basketball? Yeah, you will. You'll see the trophy, but like you'll hear a tune and it'll just make you think of that song and make you think of that person you're connected with Uh and how that person was important to you. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you just stay right there for a second, but I have a class or a class question. You could guys can just show your hands. Uh, you, would it be fair to say that you are singing now to this to this day because of someone at some point in your life who you made a connection with in a choir who believed in you in some way? Yeah, now see that that's it's fairly unanimous. There was there and that's tends to be a uni, universal thing for people who sing beyond just a year or two, right? So you got you got those that class of people who will sing in high school or elementary school, junior high, whatever. So that they get that one fine arts credit that they need and then they're, they'll stop. Right. Uh, but then there's those of us who have continued uh, and you guys at the collegiate level are in that category. Usually there's someone at some point in their life that said, you know what, you can, you're good at this. Um, and, and I can tell you as, as a professional music educator for many years now, um, I do come across people who are at the opposite end of that spectrum almost every week, probably. I come across someone who says, yeah, I don't sing. Cause I, my, my choir teacher, when I was younger told me I should, I can't carry a tune and, or I should just mouth the words. Like it's unbelievable how much that happens. Uh, and so there that's, that's important to keep in mind. We do get a special kind of gift to do this. So I have a question for you though, without your K through five. And I remember there was another elementary school, um, um, education major that we talked to earlier. Um, have you guys come across or have you thought ahead to the concept of using music within the general elementary school classroom? And what are your thoughts about that? Or, or what are you hoping to achieve there? Uh, yes, I've thought about that a lot. Uh, I plan on being a math teacher. And I am. I remember my multiplication tables through songs and like many of my math problems through songs. And I plan on teaching the kids that I have in class one day, those songs and like being able to pour like, 
the songs and stuff that I have in my life to help me remember all that stuff into them. And hopefully they'll use it too. That's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, okay. So let's, let's hit another topic. And of course, if anyone has any burning thoughts, you, I just want you to feel free to jump up and, and talk like that's, that, that's what this show is. It's just a conversation. Uh, so feel free to do that. I would like to kind of shift then a little bit deeper into that same basic topic. Uh, you know, we talked about so far, you know, why we're in choir, like what is the, what brought us here where we are. The next thing I want to talk about and see if you guys are willing to share and uh, feeling like you can open up a little bit uh, about, are there ever moments where you need choir? In other words, it plays a role for you in some kind of a mental health capacity and some type of a um, reduction of anxiety capacity, or does it sometimes create anxiety? So how does, how does choir uh, play with your emotions, either for good or evil? Anyone have any thoughts about that or stories that they'd be willing to share? Uh, um, I'm Melody Schultz. I'm a sophomore and I'm a music education major. Okay, great. No matter what's going on in your life, you have somewhere to go and you feel like everybody there cares about you. Like, and you know that everybody is going through their own stuff. So when you're going through stuff, it makes it easier. And that's always been something that's stuck with me. Like when I'm, when I teach little kids, I want them to know that like music is a way that they can express how they feel without like doing like crazy stuff, you know? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's a health, it's a healthy outlet. Yeah. And I want, I want them to be able to cling on to that. Right. Yeah. That, and, and I know as a music education major, at some point you will have the opportunity to figure out a way to get music to serve some type of a function for a student someday, or hopefully many students, uh, that it was able to serve for you. And, and that's, and that's one of the, I think most rewarding, and I bet Miss Ritter would agree with this too. One of the most rewarding things about what we get to do, um, is we get to, uh, take this thing and say, hey, this helped me a lot when I was your age, uh, being in this environment, this type of, of, of a group effort. And now I get to give you that gift as well. Uh, and that's pretty, pretty exciting. Um, how about, and while you're up there then, as a music education major too, you might be thinking about this already. Have you been to ryanmain.com yet? If you are a teacher of young singers, middle school, high school in particular, he's a master at engaging kids with the music that he writes. I did two of his pieces this year, even during the most bizarre semester ever during a pandemic, and the kids just loved the pieces that we did. We did his The Future Now and The Birth of Music, which are two fantastically exciting, dramatic pieces, which the beautiful thing about Ryan's music is that it's interesting and multi-layered, but it's also accessible. So I find it to be very successful in my classroom with my students and getting them to hear themselves right away as sounding good. But then there's so much to work on later. Uh, it's not fluff. It's the perfect combination for my high school kids, in my opinion. And the cool thing about Ryan's music is when you enter Coralosophy at checkout, you get 10% off. You also then own the PDF, which means that when you do it three or four years from now, you still own it. You don't have to go buy, back and buy more copies, which is a beautiful thing. So head over to ryanmain.com and use Coralosophy at checkout on his music. Do you ever get really nervous to perform or is that something that uh, as a music ed major, you're kind of over it now? Oh, I get nervous all the time. I, I, I just, I'm trying to work through it and I know that I like have to. I'm trying to get there. <laughs> what does that look like for you? So what d d describe, let's describe what that, uh, when you feel nervous to perform, what do you, is it something you feel in your body? Are you a, are you a blusher? Are you a shaker? What, how do you, how do you, how would you describe your performance like, anxiety? It, it is like I'm shaking and like my voice is shaking and I feel like I can't sing because I'm shaking. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> We picked Melody for a reason to answer this question. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So, and that's, and actually, so maybe, um, Miss Laura, why don't you come up close to the mic too for this? Uh, we can talk about this a little bit and maybe guide the group in a little bit of this discussion too, because 
what I'd like to zero in on here a little bit with this anxiety or just, I, you can call, I mean, cause I'm sure just like anything else, it's on a spectrum, right. Of uh, all the way from folks who sometimes have cr- like crippling uh, anxiety around uh, performing and to just to being nervous, right. You, you could say that everyone's nervous when they, when they perform to some degree. Um, but what, what are the types of things in your choir environment there at Walter state, would you guys describe as a way that you work to get work through those things as a group? Okay. So I will have, and I've done a lot this year, met more in the fall than, than spring, but I will have them sing in quartets or octets. Mm-hmm. And that's something that a lot of choral directors do, but I think that has helped um, give them a sense of, Number one, it makes them know they have to have their music learned and that they're going to be a little under the gun. But I think it's given them some confidence, um, especially once they have done it once or twice and they realize they can they can handle that. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a good that's a good thing we've done. Anybody else think of something that's helped you? Tell them who you are. And um, I'm Catherine. I'm a sophomore here. This year coming back from COVID and like working on choir music behind the mask has been completely different from before. And we've had to focus a lot more on confidence. And I know I struggled with that beforehand and just coming back and having to focus on that has been a different experience. Do you have any theories as to uh, Catherine, as to why the masks have made it that aspect of it worse? It's, it's easier to hide not only your sound, but just like, I don't know, behind it, you just, covers you. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh huh. Well, and I, I, I want to bounce this idea off you too, because from, from, I come at this, of course, from the teacher perspective, and that's why I'm talking to you guys is I feel like with my students, some of that is, is worse with the masks for, uh, not only because of what you said, which I agree with, which is that you can hide, you, you kind of, at some level in your mind, you know, you can hide. And so, <laughs> so when we know we can hide, we are sometimes willing to, but at the same time, we, we can't see our teachers' expressions, our fa- their facial expressions, which I think sometimes we forget how much those are comforting. I never thought because, about that. Yeah, because so for example, you're singing something, right? And, and you're nervous and you're, you're afraid it's wrong. Uh, Miss Ritter could be giving you all kinds of feedback that you don't even realize she's giving you just by the, the slight smile or a slight, even a slight frown. Could, could give you feedback that would help you become more confident because even if the feedback is maybe not positive, you're at least getting feedback so you know what to do. And when those when the mask is on, she can give you very little of that unless it's verbal. I, have you, is that a, is, do you think that's fair? Yeah, that's definitely fair. I think I did more of that when singing in choirs before than I even realized. Uh-huh. Think about it. Yeah, not to mention the feedback you get from each other in the, in the choir. Right. Yeah. Uh, you know, even just the ability to glance to the right and make sure that you're singing the same word at the same time as someone else. Um, and we do that so much in choir and we don't even realize we're doing it. Uh, and that could contribute to that. Um, does, Hey, this could be for everyone back there too. Does this kind of, does it kind of make you feel like you're a little bit more alone with the masks on? Yes. Yeah. Isn't that weird? I it's, have, um, it's interesting. I teach one choir at, Clemson University. Also, I'm an adjunct there. And so here at Walter State, we have met in a 220 seat auditorium and they've been spaced out. But at Clemson, it's probably more like, um, um, I shouldn't guess, but twice that many or more, probably seven, 800 um, seats. And their school being a university has been a little more stringent and they're spread out even more. And the group I teach there is the unauditioned women's choir. And so they have struggled even more than the Walter State kids have with confidence. And um, they, we've talked a lot about it. The masks is part of it, but I think just not being able to hear each other in a, mm-hmm. it's not a good acoustic environment. Right. So, yeah. And I'm sure you've dealt with that a little bit. Um, anybody who's taught this way this year has, but we've, We've, we've worked on it here at Walter State. I have the whole entire building to myself. We're the only, um, we're the only humanities class that's meeting in person on the whole campus. Oh, wow. So um, 
we've been able to go all over the building and try out different rooms. And so that's been helpful. We'll sing in the lobby, which has good acoustics and we'll have sectionals in different rooms, but it's, yeah, it's definitely been a challenge for them to get that confidence level. And I've mentioned it a few times every rehearsal, haven't I? <laughs> Madison. <laughs> I think it's also like in past choir experiences, if something was going on, like even if you just got emotional during a song, especially the girls, probably not the boys because they're all big and tough, but uh, the girls, if you're about to get emotional, you can reach over and grab your partner's hand and just hold that their hand through the song. And sometimes that is what you need to get through the song. You can't do that anymore. So it's kind of hard to connect with each other through that too because you can't touch each other or even look at each other in some places. So I think that's also kind of been part of our problem. Um, That's a good point. I hadn't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. The proximity, just the proximity. I think we underestimate how important that is until we can't have it. Um, just how, you know, being close by for moral support even, um, or that quick glance, like I said, that quick glance to the side to check if you're right. But then that, then that glance can also be returned with somebody who gives you the affirmation that you need like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here we are, or there you're, you're doing a good job or even just a subtle emotional exchange uh, is harder of course, from a distance. So yeah, I think you guys are to be commended, of course, for fighting through it to, to keep singing. And I know my kids at school are in a similar boat, although we're lucky because we have a very large classroom with a flat floor, which means that we don't have, uh, I, can, I can keep playing with where they're standing until it works. I actually did something funny where I went to the hardware store and I bought a bunch of long skinny pieces of wood and I just cut them to six feet because we're, we're at a six foot rule in our school district for, for singing. And so it, to, to play with the formation, I just bought a bunch of six foot sticks and I just have the section leaders hold out a six foot stick and walk through and we just move around. Uh, until we find something that works. So that's been kind of a fun experiment uh, to look at the silver lining of a crappy situation. Um, but yeah, okay. So let's let's change up topics again just a little bit. And I'm you guys are doing great and filling in with some awesome insights here. Um, graphitepublishing.com is a website that sells sheet music directly to you in PDF form. And it's got a stable of composers that you know, and they're all so fantastic. Many of them have been on this show in Composer Exposer episodes. Uh, Christopher Harris, Eric Barnum, David Von Campen, Jocelyn Hagen, Tim Takash, just so many more. Joshua Shank, they're just great composers on there. And oftentimes, these are composers that publish other places as well, which is why you know their names. But Graphite is a unique entity and a great company led by Tim and Jocelyn, and they are giving voice and giving ownership to composers in the digital music format, which is convenient for you, meaning you get the music right away, but it's also very helpful for the composers. They own a bigger share of what they sell. So it's a good way to support living composers. And also they have an amazing search engine on there, which allows you to zero in on the exact kind of song you're looking for, and it pulls it right up for you. So I highly recommend heading over to graphitepublishing.com and using Coralosophy at checkout to save 10%. So I have this, uh, this other kind of thing that I like to talk to kids about and, and singers about, which is what I call the uh, Instagram syndrome as it relates to singing and choir. And here's how I define the Instagram syndrome. We, uh, as a society, probably over the last six or seven years, um, have really started to, and this is a research backed up statement as well, not just something that I'm making up, but uh, have started to rely on that social media avatar that we create of ourselves and of each other more than ever before. And honestly, we're still not sure how that's going to affect the human race 20 years from now, 30 years from now. It's all, it, we are all in a, uh, an experiment, a lab experiment on ourselves. And so here's how I th think of the Instagram syndrome, which is the Instagram syndrome kind of personifies the concept that I will put what is the best thing about me on my social media. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to put an ugly picture of myself when I just woke up in the morning and, uh, or something where I'm just get, getting ready to go to bed at night and I still have to, haven't brushed my teeth and my eyes are groggy. Like that's not the picture that's going to go on Instagram, right? I, it's going to be the one that is me having fun and me looking good, right? And so that's the image of me that you'll see. 
Whereas when I see, think of myself and I create my self image, my own self image, I see all of those nasty moments. And so what I've noticed people are starting to do more and more, especially young people, because I work with young people, uh, is they start to compare the worst of themselves against the best of their peers as a result of that. And that has started to create what I call this Instagram syndrome, where it's just, I'm never quite good enough. I'm never quite uh, at what I need to be, what the world needs to uh, tell me to be. And what I'm interested in discussing, if you guys have thoughts about this, is how that can apply in a choir. In other words, uh, we are now recording ourselves as choirs more than ever before, partly because of COVID, but par partly because of the, temp the, the technology that's available to just pop a recording out of a choir really easily and really quickly that wasn't there before. And I'm afraid that we are starting to Instagram syndrome choirs as well and singers within the choirs in that you know if walter state puts something on the internet on youtube or something it's going to be the after you've practiced it a bunch of times right and they're going to it's going to be your at your best and the choir down the road might hear themselves through all the crappy rehearsal moments and all the missed notes and all the wrong entrances and all that kind of stuff that happens and and they might not be able to to see the process for you guys. Uh, is, is that something you guys ever see? And if, would anyone be willing to kind of talk through uh, in that Instagram syndrome idea with me and see if that's something you guys see in your generation at all? Like, I didn't know this was gonna get so deep. Thank you, Maddie, volunteer. Abby, you were kind of nodding. You wanted to say anything? Hi, I'm Abby and I'm a freshman. Um, for me, being in the choir, um, I compare myself a lot to other people. I don't know about other people, but, you know, you listen to people and they have a better vibrato than you do, or they just, they have a better tone than you do. And you think, well, I mean, it might be good enough to be in a choir, you know, stuff like that. Now, but, how does that, how does that affect you? Well, it just, it just makes me work a lot harder to be, to, you know, belong and know that I'm good because I mean, I think I'm good, but when you're around people that, are better than you push yourself to be better. Okay, so I'm gonna put you on the spot then and, and I'm gonna grill you a little bit. Uh, it's gonna be great fun. So would you say that there, in the, this is, and no one else is listening, just, just pretend like no one's listening. Is there anyone in the choir right now that you feel like is better than you? Um, sure, yeah, sure. Okay, all right, see, I told you this is gonna be fun. It's like therapy. Um, now, are there, is there something though, on the flip side of that, is there something that you feel like, and you don't have to call anybody out, but is there something that you feel like you bring to the choir that maybe is unique to you? Maybe something special that you bring to the choir that other people don't? Yeah, sure. I feel like I'm, I'm really good at harmonizing and I hear, like, I hear it in my head and I harmonize very well. And I know that's not a thing that everybody can do. So I, I feel like that's something I bring to the table. Right, right. And that's, and that's great. The reason I ask you those two flip side questions is because that's kind of, uh, in, in my mind, the antidote to Instagram syndrome, which is to just to be constantly mindful of the fact that yes, there might be somebody in the choir who's better, you mentioned tone or vibrato or, you know, those types of things that maybe that's something you look at yourself and you're like, that's not my strength. Maybe that's not the thing that I'm the best at. Uh, but then you also have, and that's okay, by the way, people should be able to recognize their, their weaknesses or their areas of maybe that they're not excelling, but as long as they have a healthy balance with recognizing the things they do bring to the table, that is, you know, so important because in a choir, as we said before, we're all starters. We, we need all of those things. Like we need every, somebody with all those skills to help show us the way. So that's awesome. Do we have anybody else who would be willing to be vulnerable with their Instagram syndrome uh, as it relates to choir or uh, in singers within the choir or just choirs in general? Uh, yeah. Hi, my name's Austin Lloyd. I'm a junior here at Walter State. Uh, no, one thing I just want to talk about is, uh, so here in Morristown, we have two high schools, Morristown West and Morristown East. Well, uh, I went to Morristown West, and uh, here in town, it's known that Morristown West choir is more uh, leisure. They don't try as hard as Morristown East. Now, not, not, nothing against Morristown East because I've heard their singers are super good. Um, but coming in, like, I looked at people in my class and people that, are, that came from East that are freshmen now, uh, and like, wow, they're super good. I can't even compare to uh, the level that they're at. Uh, me coming from West and it's just 
and I had to learn how, yeah, they may bring this, but I also bring this. I also bring that. And so it's just, it's a, like you said, it's a balancing act. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that dynamic, I would say, exists in a lot of towns where there are multiple fill in the blank multiple choirs, multiple football teams, multiple baseball teams, what volleyball teams that, you know, that, that aspect of it is, is also super common uh, that exists in my town. Um, and I think what's interesting about that is there even, you know, you, you came out of one of the programs and of course you're going to look at those strength aspects of the other program. Uh, what, and I bet what's interesting is if the other program were represented in this conversation, there would be something that they looked at about you. Uh, and wished they had. And, and that's and that's an interesting uh, aspect of it too that I always find uh, just fascinating because we always assume that we're the ones uh, on the on the less gr green grass side <laughs> of things. Um, so uh, when you've gotten to college then, it'd be the follow-up question, now that you're in college, how much does that still mean to you in your day-to-day -day singing experience? Is that a, a, a memory or is that still affect you in some way? Um, both. It's definitely a memory because I remember coming in, just uh, my confidence was a shot uh, looking at these other guys and girls and just thinking, you know, how, how can I compare to them? Um, and like Ms. Ritter said, this is a two year school. So my third year here, um, it's still relevant because now I'm thinking, you know, these guys uh, think of probably still think East West, you know, there's that rivalry. But once you come together in the same room, there's no rivalry. It's just a bond. And so, so do, do we have people in the room now from the, from the other side of town? Uh, yeah, de definitely. East, East and West make up the majority of the spots. Oh, that's hilarious. Okay. So, um, we're not going to have a, I'm not going to have to edit out a fight or anything. Am I? <laughs> no, no. Okay. All right. Good. Well, that's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Who, who else has some, uh, how do I compare myself problems that they'd like to air out? The doctor is in. Hello, my name is Jomari Dites. So I just like to add about the Instagram syndrome. When you said that people try to post themselves, the good things about themselves, like the best things, the good qualities, I feel like it affects people, like the students, especially in this COVID situation, how it affects students' ego, I would say. Because people, when people are now filming themselves through visuals like cameras, video, because, you know, as you can see, it's because of the situation COVID, we cannot, we cannot perform ourselves in person now. So we only rely ourselves in videos and cameras, but it affects people or students' ego because when they have the Instagram syndrome, they, they have their mindset that they want to be the best at the best that they can or best in their quality. So they would try to sing out loud or their harmonies would like break because, you know, they wanted to be the best. They want the camera to be in front of them because they want to be the center of the, you know, the video. So that, I think that's how it affects people or the students being afar, their ego. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that's really insightful because what's happening, I think in that case, the, the, the case you describe is that the only way we get interactions with people online is by making some kind of video or post or something that draws attention. And, and that's, that's what it's all about. If, cause if you don't draw attention, no one will click like, and if no one clicks like, then other people won't see it. And if other people won't see it, then you have no human connection. There's no conversation happening. So you're right. The, the incentives are, are a little bit perverse there. Uh, in fact, uh, as somebody who does a podcast as a job, I, I have the, I have to fight that same thing and I'm not saying I'm perfect at it at all. But one of the things that I have to constantly remind myself to do is that I want this show to just sound like a conversation. So of course, yes, I will edit out some downtime, but I try really hard not to edit out, edit something out just because I fumble with my words or can't quite think of, if I say, um, or whatever, like I'm not going to go through and nitpick myself to the point. Cause I want people to, to, to feel the real me, to see the real me. Um, and my goodness, that is hard on the internet. That is so hard. Uh, to get the real you across. And so it, it's an interesting thing. Uh, and I, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, had, have you ever felt like you have had to felt pressure to get sucked into that? 
Yes. To be honest, yes, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think, do you think my assessment of that is fair and that, that we do it because we, it's how we connect with each other now? I feel so. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Does anybody else have anything to add on this? I was going to mention, Chris, one thing that has been unique about teaching here. This is a community college and most students um, stay two years. We do have, I was teasing Austin, we do have quite a few students that will end up being here maybe an extra semester or two. And then now with dual enrollment, we also have quite a few students that only stay one year because they come into school with a lot of credits. But um, I, I tell the choir at the beginning of every year, if you were entering the University of Tennessee or ETSU and walking into the choir room, there are those juniors and seniors that you look up to. And you can be that little freshman for at least a semester, you know. But at a community college, you really can't be that little freshman. Um, they walk in the door and I hand them music that's the same level that those schools are, are the chamber choirs that UT are singing and I expect them to be able to do it. So would you all agree there's a little bit of that, oh dear, I didn't get my chance to be the little freshman. Um, they just have to, they just have to rise to the occasion. And I think that colors the, um, the fall semester every year. There's a little bit of, of shock um, that you don't have time to ease into it. You just got to jump in and sort of sink or swim. Does anybody want to, maybe talk about, I, I just think that might be interesting for the listeners from the perspective yeah. of a junior college, community college, how you feel like that's different being in choir and better or worse. Austin mentioned the different high schools, East and West, and I came from West and I always sat in the back of the classroom and I could pretty much rely on the other people in front of me singing or like just covering me up because it was kind of leisure, whatever my teacher wasn't that in like too invested in what we were doing, but um, <laughs> coming here, it was, it was kind of a, it was a big change. Considering now, was your, was your high school choir a big choir where you could kind of hide? Uh, it was, yeah. I, it, <laughs> I don't know. How many, like 70, yeah. 60, 60 or 70 in the yeah. advanced choir. Yeah. That I I've, now my my high school choir program is uh, very, you know, very active and and I'm really picky with them and I'm very you know we we work really hard, but my largest choir is 106, and even even if we're running like a really tight ship, there are kids and it's one of the things that I regret the most about my job. I love my job, but that's if I had to pick one thing, uh, it would be that sometimes kids slip through the cracks. They, they, uh, there's so many of them in there that I can't make a connection with every single one of them. Uh, there just isn't enough time in the day. And then there's always going to be the kid who comes out of the, my classroom at the end of the year, thinking that they didn't really matter to me. Um, and I hate that because of course they all do. It's just that it takes, and we were talking about the masks earlier. It takes face connection to get people to actually think that you care. Uh, and that's something that has been, has been really hard, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's really good. And it's really good insight, uh, because in your environment there, um, in a chamber choir type environment, you get to really make those connections, which is awesome. All right. So I have one more topic and Mr. Ritter, I'd like actually you to start your with the response on this one. Um, some, sometimes we talk, and in fact, this actually kind of is related to my last topic in this, um, just the modern I guess the modern world in the context that choir lives in, uh, which is this online culture, but also uh, trying to then exist in a real life connection world. And COVID of course, basically has unplugged us for a while. And then now we're getting slowly plugged back in around the country in these in-person in interactions with each other. And, uh, and it's been interesting to see those differences, but there's uh, there is an increasing importance being placed on the concept of creating safe places within education environments, right? So what I'd like everybody to think about responding to is what makes a choir a safe place? Assuming it is one, of course, and you can talk about that too, uh, but thinking about your past experiences in choir, maybe that did not feel safe, uh, maybe you didn't feel welcome, or maybe or the places you have felt safe and welcome, 
what, what contributed to that? So what made the choir experience a safe place for you, a welcoming place for you? And then Laura, why don't you start by responding how you as a teacher try to create that? Okay. Um, well, I, I mean, I do believe that is one of the essential things um, about the environment that we want to create. And um, one thing that's a little unique, um, I have been at Walter State for 27 years. And, oh, wow. Yeah. That's awesome. I told you I was old. <laughs> um, and so when I started, there was uh, the choir program had pretty much died. There was no choir. So I um, just basically everyone I would see on campus, um, I would ask uh, about being in choir, called all the high school directors in the area. And um, this is also my hometown. So I grew up here um, and it was funny listening to the kids. Uh, one of the girls that said her dad is a choir director. He and I were in high school choir together. One guy sitting here, um, I was in the nursery in First Baptist Church with his uh, dad, you know, so I have I have all these connections and I think um, connections has kind of been our theme this year. But I think when you my, my goal is always to provide those connections, first of all, within the group that I have and with each other and with me. Um, we're very lucky um, that we have, we've kind of done a team approach this year. We have four other directors um, and we all, it's not really like, I guess maybe I'm considered the main director, but really they all do. Um, we all, we all direct, we all teach and that's been neat. Um, but so we, we create connections with each other, but then I try to instill that choir is, con is uh, connecting us to our community and I'm sure you've probably experienced this too, but um, in the fall, especially when the world pretty much was shut down, we would post videos on our Facebook page and not even really quality ones, just something I took with my iPhone and the amount of people that would send me messages that that brightened their day or that reminded them of when they were in high school, all those connections, you know, that we've made in our community, um, that's kind of where I start with the safe space. And I think when, I hope when students realize how connected we all are, if you're connected to me, if you're connected to each other, then we want to take care of each other and we want each other, we want everyone to feel safe. So I think that may be where I start that. But then, yeah, I'd love to hear some of y'all. Um, Madison? Yeah, come on down. Yeah. Um, I kind of think I've experienced both like choirs where I feel safe and feel welcome and feel like I have a place and choirs where I don't. And um, I think a big thing about that is like um, Kat was talking about earlier, there are people who kind of hide behind. I was never that person. I was always the one who's loud and proud and super loud. I'm an alto and they used to say soprano tenor basses in Madison. Like that's just what they said. <laughs> Uh, because I've just always been, even though I hate singing by myself, when I'm with other people, I just get a lot more confident. And sometimes that can come out as I'm trying to be cocky or I'm trying to be loud to overpowering any, everybody else, which it's not. It's just I'm happy and I'm in my element. And I think that that is also to do with I feel safe being that person and singing out and singing um, to where people can hear me, where if I'm just singing by myself, I'm going to, I'm not going to sing loud. I'm going to, like Melody was talking about earlier, I'm going to shake and I'm going to get red and, um, just kind of not even think about it and just want to get it over with. But where I feel safe and where I feel like I have a place, um, I am more confident to sing out. And I also think that like I said earlier, choir is a family. And so sometimes it's not necessarily going to feel like a safe place, not necessarily safe, but you're going to have your days. Families fight and families don't get along and families can have, especially when things around you in the world are pressing down on you and you've got so much going on at home and online with the Instagram syndrome and all that kind of stuff. And I think that it's important that even if it doesn't feel like a safe place, at a certain point in time that you stick to it and that you stay with it because you're going to get past it and you're going to push forward. And like Miss Ritter is 
I consider her a family member and me and her can go at it sometimes. But I always know that if I had a car accident and couldn't get anybody to come pick me up, she'd come get me. So I think that's a lot to do with the safe and building that family and that connection within your choir. Yeah, that's wonderful. Now, I would say that we fight as much as we do with our family because it's safe. Yeah. Because we know that tomorrow your brother's still going to be your brother, no matter what you say to him. Yeah. Uh, or your mom or your dad. Or, and so there is that an aspect of it that when we tend to fight the most with the people we love the most, because there's more at stake, yeah. uh, th- those interactions, you can't just walk away, yeah. um, which is an option when you don't know the person. So that's important. So, so what would you say, uh, would you say that it's more about you? Cause you mentioned there have been some choir environments for you where that does, you do have that feeling and somewhere you don't. Is it more about the director or is it more about the, the singers in the room where you, where that comfort level comes from? I think a little bit of both. We actually talked about this a little bit before we got on here, but a lot of people, especially in high schools, um, think choir and band and music people are like geeks and they're <laughs> nerds and whatever. And so you're kind of taught to just reel it back in. And then when you get a room full of people who are told to reel it all in, if you push forward and speak out, then they tell you to push back. Then you become the outcast in the group of quote unquote outcasts. So Mm -hmm. um, I think that that on top of sometimes um, it's, it's been a while since this has happened, but I've had directors where I feel like, you know, we just aren't connecting and they don't understand where I'm coming from. And um, then I feel like, well, I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just going to shut down. I'm just not going to sing out. And so I think it really can be both, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, Who else has something to say about this topic? So what makes a choir feel safe and welcoming to you and what makes it not? Hi, I'm Jackson Mullins. I'm a sophomore here at Walter State. And one thing I would say that makes this feel like a safe place is uh, one thing I hate a lot is when like teachers or leaders, you know, if you don't do it their way, it's, you know, it's their way or no way. And one thing that I really like about this choir is that Miss Ritter and our other directors really, they care about what our opinion is. And, you know, they, they like before this, they asked us about our opinions on some stuff. And it's like even – even like there's a song I don't like right now, but, and we're still going to do that song, but they heard my opinion about it. And you know, I was very grateful that they listened to me. So that's one thing. It's just being able to like, like you're saying, have a communication with uh, our directors. And that just feels like a safe place here. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, I feel like choir, unlike other classes, it's not really like a teacher and like students. Like we don't just sit here and like take notes and listen to Miss Ritter or whatever she's saying. Like, I mean, we, we write in our binders, but you know, um, it's more like we like communicate with her. Like she is like our other mom or Clay, who's our other director. He's like one of us, you know, like he'll sing with us. And it's just more of like an intimate, it's like more intimate than other classes. And I think that's, what's really cool. Like we really all are like brothers and sisters and like we laugh and we talk and class instead of like, it doesn't feel like we're just sitting in a class and like doing work. Like we're actually making music and it's, we're making memories and we're having fun while doing it. And I think that's, what's really cool about choir in general. Yeah, no, I agree with you completely. In fact, one of the things I like to say is that uh, a great teacher of anything, a great teacher will trick students into learning, Uh, meaning they're just having fun doing stuff. And in the meantime, they've learned something, they look back and they don't realize that they've, that they've learned it. Now, I think music teachers might have an unfair advantage in that category because we tend to attract students that, that choose to be there, um, which you know, for all of my math and science colleagues out there that might listen to this, I do think we have a leg up there because everyone has to take math. Everyone has to take science. And so it's a little bit harder, but I think that that's, you, you just hit on an, a really important point is that when you can laugh and when you can be yourself and when you can be at home, you will learn more. Um, and that's, that's the beautiful, beautiful thing about what it is that we do in, in, in class together. That's great. Anybody else? 
we've got time for a couple more, so feel free to be brave. I'm Matthew Winstead. I'm a freshman, and I think part of it is uh, with creating a safe space, it's almost not that you have to force that kind of energy into a group of people. It just falls into place like that because yes. these connections we're making, these friendships, this family feeling that everybody seems to share, it comes from being connected with the music and all of us being vulnerable for a moment and being able to share that vulnerability and be a part of each other just as much as we are a part of the songs and the music that we do. Yeah, that's a really good insight because uh, you what you just touched on there was the requirement that the, the singers in the room have to contribute to that safe space as well. But uh, by, by being like, I have to be willing to be vulnerable if I expect you to be. Um, it, it, cause I can't just ask you to do it and then I'm not going to do it. And so we, we talked earlier about the, the role that the classroom environment plays and that the role the teacher plays, but I think really that's where the students and the singers in the choir come in, uh, to that aspect is that we model it for each other. We're, we're, I'm going to lay down so that you feel comfortable laying down. Like you, I'm going to hold like the, the old image of the, the soldiers in world war one and the trenches, right. Where they slept up with their backs up against each other. So they didn't drown in the mud. You know, it, that, it, there, there, ha, there is that aspect of teamwork uh, in choir, which is beautiful. Thank you. Hi, my name's Cora and I'm a freshman. Um, one of the things that's made choir a safe place for me is feeling that our directors go the extra mile in everything that they do. They're not so much like just choir directors. They're kind of like that friend that you can lean on because I remember coming in to Walter State and feeling so overwhelmed by all the things that I had to have. It was just it was, I don't know, it was very stressful. Um, but I remember my schedule was completely and utterly messed up and I didn't know what to do. I'd gone through my academic advisor at least three times and it <laughs> was still messed up, but I didn't know what else to do. So I texted Miss Ritter and she helped me settle it all out. But they always are just willing to go the extra mile and that kind of creates that special relationship that makes me want to come to choir and makes me want to do my best and be my best. Yeah, absolutely. That, that yeah, you have to have that leader. All right, that is really important. That that role setter, that model. That's awesome. Thank you. I'm back. Um, so to elaborate on what they're all saying about being like brotherhood and sisterhood, I, I want to elaborate on like unity. We're all unified together through song. We're uh, unified with the people that have sung the same song in the past, and it kind of connects us to them even like the ones that have passed away and have moved on to the other life, they're still like, they're still in the song when we sing it. And like some songs, it just clicks. It stimulates a different part of your mind. It just makes you think about the people who you've lost in your life and like how much you miss them and how that song is for them and that you sing it to the best of your ability to like, just make them proud of you. Yeah. That's that. I, that's very, uh, very philosophy, which is the name of my show, got baked it right in there. So I appreciate that because um, I had a teacher once that used to describe that same concept, which is that we, in a very literal sense, when we sing a song, we, we send a vibration into the universe that has already been there. It was there before we did it, and it will be there after we're gone, but we are, we are going to give it energy so that it can continue. Right. So it's almost like wait, we think about like waves in an ocean where the, the ocean's there, whether we're there or not, but we can add to it. Like we can add our own little piece to it. And I think that's a really beautiful image that we get to do when we're in choir. Uh, and, and we're all on the same team when we do it, which is fantastic. That's awesome. Any final thoughts from you guys? You guys are doing great. This is awesome. Um, my name's Haley. I'm a freshman. Um, and for me, I feel like choir is a safe place because a lot of us are going through the same things. We're um, are all around the same age. And, and I feel like when we come in here, we can talk about those things with each other. We can understand each other and help each other. And then when you put song into that, it helps us to really just express those feelings. And it makes you feel, for me, on top of the world. Um, music is just uh, a safe place. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Thank you. I'm back. <clears throat> when you said when you said that choir is a safe place, it really did struck me 
because I myself from is from the Philippines and I moved here when I was in freshman and I didn't know that choir existed. So back then I was struggling to socialize with people, to talk to people even. So I just hid myself in the bathroom and people realized that I just hide there all the time. So they just like keep slamming the door, kicking the door. And I felt helpless and I felt sad because I felt like I was bullied by other people. So when I moved to sophomore year, that's when I realized that there's a class called choir. And I was like, yay, I like singing. So I want, so I joined choir and it really made me happy and emotional because what Madison said that people are labeled there as weird or odd students. It, it, it made me fit in because I was different and I was considered as odd, but I never considered them as different or odd even. I felt myself as a family and welcome there. And I found myself friends to talk to and people to hang out. And I always look forward going to school now when I join choir. And that's just how I labeled choir as a safe place. And it's just made me happy. That's wonderful. I have a question real quick. So when was that sophomore year? I'm just making sure that was sophomore year of high school, right? Yes. Where you started. Okay. So when did you move uh, from the Philippines then? Freshman year. Oh, so, all right. So this was like, you were brand new and trying to figure out things and choir was like a net that caught you in a lot of ways. That's really awesome. Now, since you've been singing in choir, uh, are you now uh, uh, more familiar with the, the amazing choral tradition that is in the Philippines? Yes, I am much more familiar and much more used to, especially the culture and the language and how different it is in comparison of the choir in the Philippines and choir in this country. Uh-huh. Yeah, I just know I've had some former students that f- were from the Philippines as well. And, and oddly, and I don't know how to explain this, but uh, the professional choir that I direct one, was one of my other hats that I wear um, of the, the second most hits we ever get on our website is the Philippines behind the U.S. And it, like they just love us over there. I don't know even how that happened. Probably just YouTube. I don't, uh, maybe just something from YouTube that they liked. I don't know. But it, there, there are like the Philippine madrigal singers. Oh, my goodness. They, they are fantastic. So, yeah, there's a great tradition that uh, there as well. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's awesome. Thank you. I just, I just like to add because yeah. Philippines, Philippines, we always do singing. We always do karaoke in every parties and every social events. We just sing and sing and sing. Even grandparents who are like in 80s or 90s, they would sing random old songs. And we just like, okay, it's just, it's just amazing. Like we're full of livelihood with, with singing and all that tradition. It just made me happy. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I, I'm glad you brought that up too. And this, I, I, I could do an entire other podcast now, probably on my sadness that that is no longer part of American culture the same way it was when I was you all's age. Uh, just the, the number of shared songs that we all just knew. Um, it, it is, is harder now. Um, just, and I think it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just make, kind of makes me, you know, nostal- nostalgic because I think it's true that that my generation sang more outside of class um, than the, the current generation. And it probably has to do with a little bit more of that internet stuff where we just, we have, I had less to do you guys when I was your age, there was, not, there was nothing else to do. We had to sing. Uh, we had to, or play sports or run around outside. Like that was all we had. So that's, that's, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that. Anybody else? Last, last call. All right. Why don't you guys give yourselves a hand? This was fun. Thank you for having us. All right. Thanks, everybody. You guys have a good Saturday. Bye. Thank you all so much for sticking around and listening to that experimental episode, you might call it. Uh, And I think I'll do some more. I've got some choirs lined up. And of course, if you would like to have your choir participate in this program. I'm going to call it a student perspective series, and I will categorize them on my website, corelosophy.com, in the same way that I categorize all my other 
content specific series. So on my website at Coralosophy under the show tab, you can see all of the different types of episodes that I've done and I've grouped them to make them easy to find. And I'll add this because you can add as many tabs as you want on a website. It's a beautiful thing. So it'll be a student perspectives tab. You can also find the COVID conversations tab there. You can find the uh, choral music, a human art form. That's my social justice related episodes that have all been gathered there. The Oxford series is there under as a tab too, so that you can hunt and find at the coralosophy.com as a search engine, basically for all of the, the growing library of types of stuff that have been on the show now for the two, the two years that I've been doing the show. So thank you so much for listening as always like share, subscribe, help me beat the algorithms by interacting, commenting, uh, especially though the, the sharing like in a choir director Facebook group about a topic that is being discussed is very helpful. Um, writing ratings, you can write a rating in the Facebook, or on the Coralosophy Podcast Facebook page. You can write it on the iTunes Facebook page. Those types of things help other people see the show. So I appreciate it. Thanks for listening and thanks for watching. See you next time.